Professor Lawrence Young from the University of Warwick, who's going to chair the fourth and last session of the afternoon for us. So over to you, Lawrence. Thanks, thanks Lucy. Um, thank you, everybody, for sticking with us. Um, we're coming now to um, session four, which is the final main session this afternoon. Um, and this is a session where we're going to look at systemic responses to infection, um, starting with my colleague, Professor Dimitri Gramatopoulos. Dimitri is Professor of Molecular Medicine and he's consultant in clinical biochemistry at the University Hospitals Coventry and Warwickshire NHS Trust. Um, a long and uh, illustrious career looking at, mainly a lot of it is endocrinology. I've been able to persuade Dimitri over the last year that viruses are also quite interesting. Um, but Dimitri has a long history of looking at markers in the blood. He actually has done some work in in cancer as well and he's turned that expertise now to looking at the impact of uh, COVID-19 on various factors in the blood in this and coming up with uh, approaches to look at uh, the potential use of biomarkers both for diagnosis but mainly in the prognostic setting. He's going to talk about profiling the cytokine storm in COVID-19 patients and correlating this with disease outcomes. So I'll hand over to Dimitri. Thank you very much, Lawrence, for the kind introduction. And uh, certainly, uh, immunology is something that uh, is uh, growing, uh, especially when it's linked with, with the endocrine responses. But uh, regarding this, uh, sorry, that's, uh, are you able to share, to have a look? Yes, I think you yes. have. So, um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be uh, part of this exciting meeting and especially uh, be amongst the, the wealth of uh, immunology experts across the West Midlands. And so what I'm presenting uh, uh, today, the next uh, few minutes, is our, is our efforts in characterizing uh, some of the uh, cytokine responses, uh, uh, decoding the cytokine storm in COVID-19 uh, COVID patients and potentially find ways, identify ways that can correlate with disease outcomes. And I have to say that uh, uh, this is a uh, interdisciplinary effort it, it, between the World Medical School, which uh, both Lawrence and myself were, were, were part, uh, the WMG, the World Manufacturing Group, with the University of Warwick that uh, uh, this, uh, they provide uh, experts in, in data science uh, and also, of course, the, the, the clinical biochemistry uh, department at UHW and the Institute of Precision Diagnostics uh, Pathology. I have to, uh, uh, to acknowledge the funders of the of the study, which there was the R&D department from UHW, as well as the, uh, the Warwick uh, uh, Global Research Priorities, uh, the health uh, part. And this, uh, this, this effort, this project was really done in collaboration with uh, Quantarix and uh, with the lot of the measurements of the cytokines that they will present. And I have to acknowledge the contribution of Martha Miles, who was uh, key in order in, in, in supporting us in, in getting the samples processed uh, and shipped over in the other side of the, of the Atlantic. So uh, I'll, I will just start with something that uh, I've seen, most of you have seen it uh, uh, hundreds of times about the uh, the, the COVID-19 as a, as a global pandemic, the major uh, health challenge. So it is responsible for uh, over 100 million cases uh, and, and, and millions of, of, of deaths. And the important part about this, this disease uh, and this, uh, why it's such a major challenge for the healthcare system was the fact that uh, a significant proportion of patients required uh, hospitalization. And that's what we found from the early stages of the pandemic where, and especially in other countries, where they, they, they were, the, the healthcare systems were overwhelmed with uh, patients coming in the hospital. The other important feature of the disease, of the, in, in the pathology of the disease, was some very severe clinical uh, manifestations that include uh, not just uh, pneumonia, but also the acute respiratory distress syndrome. And also, uh, in, in, for many patients, they had uh, multiple organ failure, uh, damage in the lungs, and that potentially might have a, a consequences uh, and complications in the in the post-COVID uh, uh, life uh, for the survivors. They had, uh, many patients uh, experience uh, acute kidney uh, injury and, and failure, and also uh, heart problems 
as well as other conditions that uh, they were strongly associated with, uh, with poor outcomes. And of course, a major, uh, uh, a major feature of the pathogenesis was development of the state of hyperinflammation and uh, what was characterized as a, key, uh, as a cytokine storm. So I'm sure all of you, uh, the, the virologists and immunologists, they were able at this kind of, of, of complex uh, uh, diagrams about the, all the, uh, the, the different mechanisms, molecular mechanisms involved in the development of this uh, cytokine storm. But for people like me, which are more like enthusiastic uh, immunologists, I would much more prefer the very uh, simplified version of this, where the, the virus, the infection, uh, uh, will affect the, the immunocytes and, in, and, and it will drive uh, responses, cytokine responses, and, and primarily associated with increased expression of, uh, of, of key cytokines, such as IL-6 and TNF-alpha and, and the interferon gamma, which of course, in, in, in most patients, will, it, will, it, it will be targeted to a balanced immunity, uh, virus elimination and recovery, but in a significant proportion of patients, what we find is that there is development of the cytokine storm, which is characterized by a state of uh, neutrophilia uh, and, and lipopenia. And, uh, and as, as we can see later, it is reflected on one of the markers that we use to characterize disease, and it will lead to uh, serious uh, complications, or organ damage and failure and potentially and in, in, in a significant number of, of patients that will lead to, 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 to death. So th and these are some of the, of the key phenomena that, that the, I guess, the scientific and the clinical community they focus their effort in trying to understand the pathogens of the disease, but also try to uncover and, and mine uh, potential markers that will help us in, the, uh, in managing those patients. Because you have to remember that these are, these, these are patients, this is a disease that, that was never seen before, and nobody really had any experience in dealing with this, uh, this type of patients outside a few, a few centers. So I guess uh, one of the, uh, of the highlights, one of the successes of, the, uh, of, uh, of, of how the, the world dealt with, with such a, a global pandemic was the fact that the, the biomedical community through the kitchen sink in to try to understand the, uh, some of the key characteristics of the, of the cytokine storm in a very short period of time. We, we, knew, we knew a lot and we were able to identify a lot of bio, potential biomarkers and come up with new concepts, uh, especially around the cytokines. I, I'm sure you, you all have seen the, the publications and you know that IL-6 has been identified as a key uh, cytokine in managing patients and predicting uh, patient, patient outcomes. And a lot of, there are a lot of potential uh, advanced math mathematics modeling that involve the measurement of, of their based on, on, on IL-6 levels. And there was uh, a, a number of some very good publications around proteomic characterization of the, of the uh, in, in, in serum markers that identified a lot of the, of the different uh, abnormalities and potentially they can be used for the development of, of, of new bi of, uh, biomarkers. As well as uh, you heard a, a number of the previous uh, talks there was very much focusing on on the CD4 and CD8 counts on on, on these uh, on, on these patients. So we thought right from the start of the of the pandemic how potentially we, we can contribute in the uh, in this and try to understand more about the site of the cytokine uh, uh, levels uh, that in in our patients. So one of the uh, an approach that we took and one of the uh, of, of the uh, very, very helpful uh, steps that we took along the way is that we were able to store all samples, all serum samples from the COVID patients uh, at UHW and the University Hospital in Coventry works here. So we were able to, to uh, develop uh, a COVID-19 biobag that uh, collecting the, the leftover samples from after coming from the routine investigations. And for this study that I'm going to talk we, uh, we enrolled uh, samples from uh, about 57 uh, uh, COVID positive patients and uh, 23 uh, COVID negative uh, patients confirmed by, by, by PCR or uh, the, the status was confirmed by PCR. And also 
the, the, the samples were taken during the early stage of the, of, of, the, of the pandemic. So effectively, there was no, the patients did not receive any specialist treatments that they, they were introduced later in the, in the course of the, of the pandemic. So the, the patients that were enrolled was from the, from the end of March until the beginning of, of, of June. So the, for, for this study, we have uh, uh, 10 patients, we include 10 patients with severe disease severe WH, so uh, severity score of five to seven. And these are patients that required intubation or CPAP uh, intervention. We had uh, 27 patients, which unfortunately they died due to the course of, the, of their hospitalization in the disease. And also we had about uh, we had 20 patients uh, that with mild, uh, with mild symptoms, uh, which is, uh, the severity score was uh, three to four. So, uh, and this is some of the, of the characteristics of these of these patients. And as you can clearly identify, it is it is a cohort of patients which is very much uh, similar to what has been uh, reported around the uh, in the country in terms of the the demographics of these patients. So we have a, uh, it is biased towards older males. So most of the patients there is a ratio uh, two to one males to females. The, the patients that they had severe disease or the uh, or or most patients patients that were hospitalized they were around the uh, uh, over 55 years old and, and those that they died was uh, 70 and, and, and about uh, the the mean the mean age was, was 70. so also the majority of the patients were uh, white british Irish, uh, and and also uh, which is in a way, reflects the population of the of the area and pa patients that they were uh, admitted hospitalized. Another important feature is the uh, the significant level of comorbidities, which again it is characteristic of the population of West Midlands. So most patients they had a number of comorbidities, and especially if you focus on uh, comorbidities such as diabetes and obesity, which have been identified as, as risk factors for, uh, for, poor, for severe disease and, and poor outcomes uh, in, in COVID patients. So one, another point that I think help, uh, uh, help us in, into setting up cohorts and study those cohorts is the uh, uh, very early from the onset of the pandemic, we were able in clinical biochemistry to introduce a COVID specific uh, uh, panel of biomarkers and which they, they were, uh, th these were based on the early reports from Wuhan ab about what uh, uh, abnormalities were found in COVID patients and included uh, biomarkers such as CRP, which is a non specific marker of inflammation that we, we use routinely in the lab. Uh, it, it included procalcitonin, which is a, a marker of, it's been proposed to be a marker of sepsis, has very limited routine use in, in, in the labs. Interleukin-6, which was uh, uh, a marker that has never been used routinely in, in, in the lab in, in, in a wide range of, of patients. And then you have ferritin, troponin, the BMP, and uh, albumin, LDH, iron, and transferrin as well. So by having those uh, markers, we're able to get a good a picture of the, the, of the, the metabolic disturbances that they were taking place in, in, in these patients and, and do it over the course of a, uh, of, of a period during the hospitalization by taking serial samples. So as you can see in this cohort that, that I'm presenting today, you, uh, you clearly see that uh, interleukin-6, for example, is uh, it's significantly raised uh, in, in patients with severe disease uh, uh, or, or, or disease. Uh, the, uh, the the CRP also was uh, significantly raised, and of course, one uh, marker that uh, we discussed previously was very much linked with the pathophysiology of the, the of, of the disease is the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. Because in the state that of uh, neutrophilia and lymphopenia, the the, the the ratio neutrophil to lymphocytes is significantly raised, and there are reports that uh, a cutoff of eight and above is a significant indicator of poor prognosis and, and, and death. And of course, another marker that uh, we, we've been using is the, 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 the uh, systemic immune inflammation index, which is very similar. It is based on the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, but you include the platelets as well, because another feature on some patients is you have a platelet granulation. So this 
these markers, and of course, you can see differences in a, in a number of these uh, parameters, help us to get a, a better picture of this uh, of, of of the disturbance or, uh, of, of these patients. So, and just plotting, do some very simple plots in these patients. You, uh, we can use uh, violin plots that are uh, able to demonstrate the distribution and the density of, of, of the values that, that we're getting. So, for example. To, if we would like to draw your attention to the uh, to, to this to, to aisle six, where you can clearly see the the, the range uh, of the and the distribution is much higher. So, uh, in 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 contrast, markets such as ferritin and the, the the systemic inflammatory index as well is, is raised in, in the the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. In contrast, ferritin and CRP appear to be uh, fairly similar between the severe and the disease patients. So these biomarkers enable us to start putting together uh, journeys, the, uh, uh, the the patient's journey trajectories during the stay, especially if we're able to to link it with the comorbidities and the demographics, and uh, the length of stay, the interventions, and the outcomes. And we can actually use those biomarkers, uh, potentially use those biomarkers as as flags or signposts. To, to monitor the, uh, the, the, the progression during hospitalization and potentially use them in order to develop the uh, predictive to, uh, tools. So we thought that in addition to those routine markers, if, if we're able to, to enrich our understanding by including a number of, of different uh, cytokines, so we'll be able to get a little more rich and dense information about this, uh, these patients. And in, in, this, in this example, uh, the, the, the yellow asterisk, identify some of the cytokines that we focus our attention that included both uh, interferons, uh, uh, alpha and gamma, as well as a number of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as IL-6, uh, IL-18, IL-10, which uh, although it's an anti-inflammatory, there are some reports that also can play a role in COVID in uh, pro-inflammatory uh, promotion and, and also IL-12 and, and IL-17. So, uh, when we send the samples to to, to Conterix, uh, one of the of, of, of the key characteristics we want to ensure that the quality of the samples that we send was appropriate. And as you can see on the bottom left of the uh, of, of, of the, uh, of the of the page is you see the the, the measurement of the IL six comparison between the ROS assay that we use routinely and the Conterix assay, and we had a very good correlation, which reassured us about the quality of the samples that we are sending. So, as I said, is that using those markets and the, and the results that we got, we were able to put, to put together some initial uh, trajectories of the patients. And one thing that, one important point here is that you can clearly see a very different, uh, quite a heterogeneous group of patients that belong in, in each of the, of, the four, of the four groups, which is the, uh, the, the negative, uh, the, the mild people with mild disease with uh, severe and uh, those that they, they, they died. So uh, you can see here, it's, it's not difficult to see that the IL-6 levels change very, is very differently in these patients. And, and both of them died within, within 10 days of hospitalization. And also uh, in this example, the, uh, the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio in this patient remained very high uh, over 10 in, 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 in the patient on, on the right. There was a sudden drop between uh, uh, from 20 down to, to five and so on. So you can clearly, uh, you can put together an, an, a number of these uh, the disease trajectories for, uh, for, for each patient and, uh, and, and, and you can monitor, you can use the cytokines to, mo to, mo to monitor the stay in, in, the, in, in the hospital and, and correlate, of course, with, with, with outcomes. So, and, uh, so th these are the patients, that the mild ones, as you can clearly see, uh, but again, the, uh, usually the patients with mild disease, they have, they have lower um, uh, levels of, of, of all the biomarkers that we measure. One key feature that we found uh, in, in, in all this, uh, the analysis of the biomarkers was especially the, the cytokines, it was the lack of correlation uh, compared to each other. And then in a way it paints a picture about this, uh, the, the disease that causes complete dysregulation of a lot of these, of, of the biochemistry, uh, the biochemical markers that, that, that we investigate. So it, with the exception of uh, a good correlation between interferon gamma and alpha, uh, 
in the uh, in, in 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 COVID negative patients, we were not able to find any significant uh, correlations. And uh, when we looked at uh, the distribution again, and this time we used different analysis, uh, employing the Z scores, the distance from from the mean, you clearly see. How, and with a color-based uh, analysis, you clearly see how the, the color changes, the, the distribution and patterns of color changes as you as you move from the negative patients to all the way to to, to the disease based in the severity, in case severity. And example, in this particular example, as you can see, you have a lot more red uh, in uh, IL six and, and IL eighteen. So. The, uh, the last couple of slides I've got that, uh, to, to present is that we also put, uh, put together some violin trees uh, uh, about this, uh, these biomarkers and we can clearly see as the disease severity moves uh, from the mild to, to the most to the disease patients, you can see a different uh, change in the shape of, the, of, these, of, of these biomarkers. And then of course, when we, we analyze the uh, statistical significance, you can see uh, important differences between the different biomarkers and this potentially could be useful in identify uh, in, in the future when we try to identify and distinguish between patients that are going to have mild disease to patients that are going to develop more severe symptoms and possible poor outcomes and, and, and death. And, and one that particularly features very heavily and, and performs very well in, in our statistical analysis, of course, is the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. So, and if you try to put this in a, in a more easy to, to understand uh, diagram, you can see that you will have a group of, bio, of, of cytokines that includes IL, uh, IL, TNF-alpha, uh, IL-18 and, and, and TNF-alpha, but potentially they, they seem to be affected uh, and be, uh, uh, increased in all, in all groups of, of COVID positive patients. However, you could have different cy uh, cytokines such as IL-6, which appear to be statistically significant uh, different from only in the patients who, um, uh, who uh, will, will, uh, uh, will, will pass away. And this potentially could be a very interesting feature if, if we're able to back it up with, with, more, with more patients and how we can use it uh, diagnostically. Another important uh, approach of this is to, um, and I think that's my that's my last slide, uh, is to look to, to use interferon uh, the different the three different markers and look at them whether you um, were able to distinguish the the, the different types of, uh, of of patients, and I think that's where that's what we're working try to, to understand it. So. Uh, yes, yeah, so th these, are, these are the key findings uh, that, that so far, so I think I'm, I'm already over the time, so I'm going to stop here and, uh, uh, and thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Dimitri. I think in the interest of time, we better move swiftly on to, uh, to John. So I'll uh, introduce John, who's uh, in the Department of Respiratory Sciences at the, uh, at the um, University of Leicester. And John's worked for many years on... I think mainly on TB, on cytokine responses, et cetera. And he's going to talk to us today about animal models of low dose aerosol infection and how um, you can look at this not only for tuberculosis, but beyond. So I'll hand over to John. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. And you can see my slides. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for the opportunity to speak today. And I'd also like to thank the previous speaker for a fantastic segue in, in how important it is not just to understand the effector molecules involved in, in uh, excess mortality, but also to, to really highlight how we don't have clear ideas about what the mechanisms are. And what I want to do today is talk about how animal models can be used to address and, and bring us a little bit closer to defining these mechanisms. Uh, Okay, before we start talking about any specific animal models though, I think it's essential to understand what an animal model is. And so in my experience, there's, there's often kind of a misunderstanding about what animal models can show us and what they can do and what they should be used for. And in fact, what role they play in the larger scientific endeavor. Um, in vivo studies, in my mind, form this essential bridge between clinical science and basic in vitro discovery. Examples of all of these we've heard today. Uh, clinical sciences involves using a wide variety of 
assays and tests to understand some kind of dysfunction that leads to acute disease. Uh, clinical sciences then uses therapeutics and other types of interventions in an attempt to restore the patient toward a more normal function. But all of this is predicated on the deep understanding of how the human systems function and how they can be specifically modulated. And this deep understanding, as I think we've already heard, isn't always possible. And it may be confounded by an individual's genetic makeup or, or even their underlying health conditions. So in contrast, uh, our basic research seeks to kind of characterize the fundamental composition or the reactivity, the interactions, or, or even the in vitro behaviors of, of, um, of you know, just these, these simple experimental systems. And this, this discovery research is critical for the generation of hypotheses and for building a broader picture of the problem, specifically the problem that we've got now, which is how uh, SARS-CoV-2 attaches, infects, and is shed from host cells, and how this then impacts the, the host, the, the patient. And so these two pillars, clinical science and basic research, have some obvious overlap. And these, this overlap is readily apparent in literature and even in the talks today. So critically, in my mind, animal models form a third pillar in which interventions can be tested in a well-defined exemplar mammalian system. So using a mammalian system like this, uh, it's got all of its inherent complexities and it provides an essential bridge between these, these in vitro discoveries and clinical science. Uh, so I assert that the, the best animal models are those that possess kind of the simplest complex system in which an intervention shows some kind of an effect and where the organism is able to respond in some manner that's akin to that we see in humans. So this in vivo response almost never has the same clinical appearance in humans. Although not in every case, in non-human primates in, in uh, SARS-CoV-2 models, uh, there is a good match for human uh, symptoms and disease progression. But in more general terms, a good animal model must show some level of equivalency. Now, it doesn't mean that it's going to be an exact match, and it shouldn't be. Uh, what this means is that in order to use animal models effectively, we really need to uh, have a detailed understanding of both the human and the model organism in order to really understand where they share functions and mechanisms, and more importantly, where they don't. Uh, so we'll come back to this, this idea in a, another couple of slides. So expanding on this, this concept of, of a minimal complex system, it's really the key to animal models. Uh, so in this regard, we're interested in an organism's uh, capacity to generate a consistent response to an intervention. And this response has got to be able to be measured and it's got to act to somehow counter that stimuli. So in my own work, I do TB. Um, in this type of work, we infect a mouse with a low dose aerosol of tuberculosis. And we know that it will always trigger a predictable sequence of molecular and cellular processes um, that result in the development of CD4 mediated T cell responses that controls the bacterial load in the lungs, right? That's the experimental system. And it's ideally suited in our hands to hypothesis testing. And what we do there is we compare the an intact, genetically intact animal with one that's had a, with a cohort of animals that's been somehow gene modified. Uh, so that we can test, make an A-B comparison in which one of those cohorts is lacking uh, a certain function or gene. Um, and so it's, it's this ability to uh, test side by side with a control group that makes animal models uh, such an important player in defining uh, mechanisms. Now, from this, there's also another correlate. And I'd observe that, that a really good animal model, it also requires a set of reagents and assays that can measure, uh, quantify the, these comparative experimental systems in some meaningful way. Um, and in a lot of, hand, in a lot of times, these, these assays are really simple. It's like just weighing an animal. Uh, or it could be more complex, like if you have to, if you're able to image an animal by ultrasound or MRI. It may include examples of stuff we've seen today, and that's the analysis of serum proteins or cytokine for ELISAs. But critically for pathogen work, and this is especially relevant with SARS-CoV-2, it's essential to measure the circulating or shed virus and its production perhaps within target tissues or organs. Uh, 
this capacity to quantify viral pathogens um, is an important consideration if you're if you're approaching uh, COVID work. And fortunately, there are some published systems in which the production of an infectious variant isn't really necessary for you to estimate viral productivity. Um, let's see, one of the, the follow-on benefits of, of using animal models as a way of getting at mechanism is the option that you can use separate genotypes uh, to combine them through selective breeding. In this way, we can actually make new transgenic mouse strains um, in relatively short order. And, and uh, Approaches like CRISPR can actually accelerate this process. So in my own work, we've used this approach to create double and triple gene knockouts. Um, in addition, since you're using, since you've got the capacity to use genetically compatible animals, you can use adoptive transfer of, of progenitor cells or bone marrow or even tissues, uh, which means that you can, you can transplant one into the other without any side effects. And my groups reported the use of, of bone marrow transplants like this to produce organ-specific transgenic models where we've got the capacity to report antigen-specific cellular activation. So there, there's some really sophisticated approaches that are available in animal models that aren't necessarily available to our colleagues that work in, in clinical science. So based on, on kind of this idea of what animal models are, I'd ask how we might expect these animal models to contribute to our growing understanding of, of are of the pathogenesis of, of infection. And how can we use these animal models to understand uh, the excess mortality that we see in some populations? So as I've alluded to, we began, our, my group began our use of transgenic mice in the 90s. And here we received uh, the, some of the first interferon gamma knockout mice. Uh, we then infected these with this low dose aerosol uh, of tuberculosis. And, and my group, as well as a lot of others, used the results of this work to establish that interferon gamma is an essential component of the immune response. Uh, this observation then was used by many other groups uh, as the basis for working out the, the major players in, in essential cytokine chemokine networks that act on a whole bunch, a whole range of, of diverse cell populations. And, and what this work did, in fact, was it, it provided the connections between various T cell compartments with the innate response, with antigen specific memory and inflammation. And critically, this work was really only possible because uh, we had access to both transgenic mice and a wide range of mouse reagents. Now, the, the point of all this digression is that animal models were used to describe these complex networks and then those complex networks, then we were able to connect with other systems that operate within the model organism. And so I've used this kind of historic kind of idea as, as context. And, and I think it provides an important precedent or roadmap for how we might be able to address the challenges that we're facing today in the pandemic. So what I think we're faced with is a viral pathogen that induces dysfunction to at least one and probably more than one uh, system in patients. And it's not just immunity that's, that's uh, dysregulated. So in many people, infection is superimposed on, on significant comorbidities. And we've already heard about that. Uh, some of these co comorbidities include things like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, neurodegenerative conditions, obesity, and high fat diets. And these dysregulating conditions uh, may be clinically managed, that is, they're treated with drugs or not. And in fact, they could be modulated by other factors like patient age and exposure to environmental insult. Now, further contributing all this complexity is the contribution of the individual patient's genetics. So in this regard, I think it's really important that, that we collectively consider the impact of SARS-CoV-2 on multiple physiological systems. And in order to do this, I think we've got to consolidate our understanding of how these multiple systems that function within the patient interact. And, and I think this is really representing our, our fundamental and most significant challenge uh, when coming to grips with uh, COVID. Uh, and I, I think that this challenge is one that's going to take the combined efforts of our research communities. And fortunately, though, this great challenge is also the source of really a, a fantastic opportunity for new and exciting science, and especially here in the Midlands. And what I mean there 
is that we've got a lot of opportunity uh, for collaboration between researchers working within all three of these pillars, within clinical sciences, within basic research, and with in vivo animal modelers. Uh, so how might this collaboration work? Well, I think that we can use the trajectory of, of disease as a, as a roadmap for identifying what animal models might be of most help. Um, and so as we progress to this, this increasingly sophisticated understanding of the course of disease, uh, we recognize that there's a set of core clinical symptoms that represent a progression from infection leading to death. And these symptoms include fever, cough, dyspnea, which is the, the shortness of breath uh, that can progress to ARDS, that's acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, and then followed by multi-organ failure. And each of these specific kind of progressive steps are, are really the, the culmination of a complex series of systems interacting. And, and each of these individually represent great cases for investigation using animal models. Now, the vast majority of animal model research that's been reported in the literature uh, specific to uh, SARS-CoV-2 involved screening candidate species for their capacity to become infected, to exhibit human-like physiological symptoms, uh, and most importantly for vaccine design to demonstrate that protective immunity can be induced. Now, unfortunately, uh, it's really only non-human primates that are that we've found that have develop a similar constellation of symptoms. And then these where these symptoms progress to uh, form life-threatening disease. However, the use of these non-human primates in research is, is really among the most highly regulated forms of animal models. And it's not available to most normal researchers. I mean, it, it's really an elite tier of folks that, that have access to these non-human primates. Of the remaining species reported, uh, there's been a range of them, and we've seen them both in the popular press and in the literature. Uh, among the interesting species that have been reported, cats. Cats have been found to be susceptible to natural infection. Uh, they can develop pulmonary edema, although its relationship to cough and shortness of breath are, are really undefined, as is the frequency of disease progression to death. Now, in terms of animal models, cats aren't commonly used as laboratory animals and their, their genetically outbred status kind of requires the number of animals required for a sufficiently powered experiment to be pretty high. Um, and in fact, they're difficult to care for in that they require specialized kind of low density housing and they can be aggressive. And perhaps most importantly, the scope and diversity of feline reagents really isn't, isn't fantastic. You're depending there on cross reactivity. Um, other species that have been uh, described in the literature also include ferrets. And now they are susceptible to both natural and laboratory infections that can, and those infections then can lead to fever and cough. But the frequency and the, the, the progression to uh, a severe human-like disease is really unclear. Uh, now ferrets are more common laboratory animals than cats, but their husbandry could be demanding because they're intelligent, they're curious, they're dexterous, and they're persistent. Um, hamsters, now they've got a, they, we all know, I think that they've got a, a, a fairly close analog to, to human ACE2 um, and certainly closer than either cats or ferrets. Uh, however, in terms of hamsters, the diversity and type of reagents available is pretty limited. So in that regard, they're not actually a, a great laboratory model. They would be if our kind of inventory and of assays and tests were expanded, but currently there's, there, there's, that doesn't appear to be anything that's on the horizon. Uh, they're easy to use in the laboratory in terms of husbandry and maintenance, but again, their, their use is fairly limited. And that, that kind of leads us to mice. Now in the UK, mice are the most commonly used laboratory animal with around 1.2 million procedures carried out, I think it was in 2019. In terms of COVID research though, they're not generally susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection. However, there are a number of transgenic mouse strains that carry the, the human um, ACE2, um, and they're reported as generally available. Now, the reality of this, when I tried to get them, is that uh, there's a waiting list, no matter who you order these mice from. And this waiting list is due to a, a, this huge demand, as you might imagine. Uh, so what you're typically gonna have to do if you're gonna try to get these mice, um, they're, you're going to probably only get a few and they're going to have to use those to set up a breeding colony. Uh, now, mice in general are excellent laboratory animals with 
this extensively characterized physiology. And because it's been so well characterized, there's this, this corresponding robust set of reagents and assays that are available to, to uh, quantify their responses. Now, they can be housed and maintained at high density, and they've got really a fairly short generation time. Um, as I've, I've suggested, they've got some, we've got some very sophisticated tools uh, that can allow us to manipulate their genes. And importantly, a lot of human drugs have a known efficacy in kinetics in mice. So that's good. Uh, but you know what? Appropriate animal subjects aren't the only consideration for coronavirus research. Uh, additional complications for, for some SARS-CoV-2 work uh, is the requirement for uh, safe biocontainment of the pathogen itself, as well as the animal, as well as the infected animals. Uh, and with this, this biosafety containment requirement, we've got a, a requirement to notify the health and safety executive of any time that we work with this pathogen. So that kind of complicates matters. Now, taking a step back and returning to the spectrum of human clinical syndromes, um, symptoms, that is the fever, cough, breathlessness, or multi-organ failure, with the additional variables associated with comorbidities, animal models, I think, represent the only means of investigating and defining specific mechanisms involved in the progression from infection to acute disease. Uh, and it's very much like we saw in the last talk. There's all these, these individual cytokines that, have been, that are correlated with bad outcomes. But you know what? We don't have specific mechanisms. There are master regulator pathways. Uh, there, are, there are clearly defined mechanisms. Uh, but we haven't connected those dots yet. We're, we're certainly on our way. So despite the significant hurdles associated with conducting animal model focused research, I think that there's a lot of benefit to this idea that, that we can take a multidisciplinary approach um, and, and the payoff for such an approach, I think would extend long beyond our, our current crisis. So kind of coming to the, the end of this, I, I think that the, the complexity of this clinical presentation, when combined with the spectrum of symptoms, means that, that we are going to need a multidisciplinary approach um, in order to, to get at the mechanisms underlying these conditions. So in this regard, I'd like to kind of think about the idea that virology expertise, in order to help with this endeavor, isn't necessarily required. Now, it would definitely help. But... As an example, I'd like to to and we've got to, I think we're gonna to have to wrap up very quick, very soon. Sorry. Okay, glad to. I'll show one more slide. Um, when we're thinking about animal models of coronavirus research, uh, this is really where you're gonna be working. Uh, there's significant biosafety and biohazard uh, requirements that you've got to address. Uh, and I think with that. I will conclude and I look forward to taking questions uh, at the end. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. Thank for you that. very much. The best way to take this forward now, I think, is to, is to go into the breakout groups and then for interested individuals to use that, obviously, to ask to, to deal with the questions that we haven't been able to cover during this and the previous session. So I think I'll hand back to Lucy now. Um, Great. That's okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's Thank great. You. Thanks very much, Lawrence. That's brilliant. So thank you very much to our speakers in the last session. In fact, actually, thank you very much to all of our speakers um, at this afternoon's um, symposium. I think it's been absolutely fascinating and I hope you've all enjoyed it um, as much as as much as I have.